Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Kryptonized. Very unique topic today. Uh, joining me is Noah Healy. We're going to talk about how to value crypto. Now, if you've been following me, watching the show, you know that I'm big on, okay, we can't just throw tokens out there. Those meme tokens to me are BS. There's got to be real value brought back to the community uh, and that value needs to have some sort of monetary function. This, even if it's a nonprofit or a decentralized token, how is it making money? Is that, that's what's bringing value to the community and itself so that it can sustain itself for uh, the, the long term. So, Noah, with that, would you give us a brief intro before we jump in? Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, so, I'm a game theorist and marketplace designer. Uh, I'm working on a patent on a new market system that I've developed for commodities. And there are a handful of projects, including a couple of crypto projects that are attempting to launch and incorporate my technology right now. Uh, and so that's, that's what got me to you. All right. And does this apply to crypto somehow, or is it just equities? Uh, so my marketplace design is primarily focused actually on commodities. Uh, the interesting thing about my approach is that it's focused on a a game theory model of the roles in the marketplace. And so it's simpler to build a market the fewer roles that there are to coordinate. The more kinds of, of players there are in the game, the more opportunities there are for collusion to occur. Uh, and under free strategic structures, notoriously three-player games uh, have no stable outcomes uh, as, as typified by, uh, you know, backstabbing films like Blood Simple or The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Uh, that's The plot of those movies is actually uh, mathematically uh, a well-known consequence of just the number of players. So are you saying uh, polygamists uh, are, are destined to fail no matter what? Well, I wasn't saying that, but yeah, actually, uh, that's also true. Um, uh, the, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem uh, with interest and polygamy uh, where society essentially restructures its interests um, away from technology and then your population base collapses. So uh, there, are, there are strong problems with, with uh, polygamous societies. Yeah. All right. We're, we're taking a tangent, uh, but sure. let's get back to valuing crypto. Okay. So when I look at valuing crypto, I have my own model. I kind of look for, obviously, there's transaction value, the, the basic KPIs, um, what partnerships they have, what's coming up the pipeline in terms of roadmap. Um, I also look at, are they making money somehow, some way? Do they plan to? How are they funded? There's, there's all these metrics that go into it, not unlike a VC looks at a, uh, an up-and-coming company or even how analysts view stocks. But crypto is fundamentally different. You know, They're not set up like a stock. They can't be valued exactly like a stock. In my opinion, you could challenge me. Um, how are you looking at taking a crypto token and valuing it? As you mentioned, that is very challenging. Uh, and they, they aren't like stocks. They're more like uh, currencies, many of them. And currencies are notoriously difficult to value. The things that you mentioned are, are very solid things, I think, and are part of any reasonable an analysis. Um, but I'd say that the first and most important thing when attempting to value uh, a coin or an offering is deciding on your own time frame. Uh, the vast majority of the, the issues are Ponzi schemes, some of them quite transparently so. Even that um, might be a reasonable short-term play if somebody's a day trader and their intent is to attempt to surf the Ponzi's into some other location. Um, so if you, if you have your immediate term hat on, then the, the kind of hype and stuff that you're talking about becomes much more viable as part of a valuing strategy. That's an extremely high risk strategy because you're willfully dealing with uh, con artists, basically. And so uh, many people who attempt to do this um, may make some paper money, but eventually will have the rug pulled out from under them. Uh, and much like high frequency traders in the stock market that suddenly get wiped out by a general market crash, um, except you don't even need a general market crash. You just need to have finally accidentally hit somebody that's less scrupulous than you are and, and happens to need the money for his vacation getaway or something. Um, 
So shifting over to the long-term value, which is, I think, a much more interesting and, and much more difficult question, um, there, what you're looking for is uh, stable equilibria in the interest space. Um, so in addition to looking at how they're making money or how they plan on making money, um, you need to look at what the incentive structures that they're putting in place around the money that they're making, how those work. Um, so if they're making money, but their long-term plan is degrading the value of their investors, then that doesn't have a long-term solution. You're, you've, you've, again, you've, you've sort of signed onto a slow motion Ponzi scheme in that case. Uh, so what you're, what you're getting at is an issue with finding a situation where roles exist that have a self-interested nature attached to them. How do you find that? Well, the technique that I use um, is I basically just get a spreadsheet and write down uh, every role within the marketplace, uh, and then I color grade them. So there's sort of three kinds of player in the marketplace. There's green players, the ones that you need. Uh, so these are the people who are operating with the coin or around the coin that are sort of the point of the coin. Um, there's red players, and these are the ones that you don't want. These are people that are attempting to subvert the system or whatever. And then there's yellow players, and these are people that you don't need, but also aren't actively harmful. Um, maybe they're nice to have. Maybe it doesn't matter whether or not they're there. Um, but for whatever reason, they might be. They might be encountered. Do you have uh, a list of green companies that you recommend? You publish these things. What I'm talking about is uh, roles within a a game uh, or within a system. So uh, I do this for uh, the people that I'm consulting with. So the I was dealing with people trying to launch a market or you know currently fundraising uh, in Singapore, and they have they have a few different levels of participation. Um, there's the basic marketplace, which is structured much like an equities market um, that allows the use of their token to proxy for uh, other um, uh, equities or, or other things um, by creating an NFT with an associated market that will mirror the value of some other marketplace. And so this would allow people to do... Like a synthetic? Yeah. This would be, allow people to essentially do cross-market investment in a globalized environment without having to meet regulatory or, or transnational uh, legal requirements. On top of that, they have uh, a regulatory mechanism that actually creates a marketplace in their fee structure. Um, and so they have basic players that want to buy and sell these synthetic tokens. Um, and then they have... Uh, sort of these higher level players that want to interact with their their fee structure markets. And then they have their investor group um, that wants to be able to participate as as funders and, and take on the fees being generated by the system. The difficulty is that um, the investor group can sort of put on the other hats. So what they actually have is more roles than that. They have investors that want to trade and manage and passively receive, and they have investors that want to just trade and investors that want to also manage, and investors that just want to passively receive. And because there's a lot of risk associated with the investors being able to take on a management role and possibly crash the marketplace, um, I've helped them work through what sort of regulatory structures they need to have in place for investors when they make that step um, to to make it so that non-predatory behavior uh, is, is rewarded and predatory behavior is, is suitably punished. Okay, but in terms of valuing the crypto itself, how, how do you go about doing that? I know you got the red, the yellow, the, the green. What are the inputs into determining the value of a crypto token in your mind? So in my mind, long-term, um, it's sustainability is the first and foremost. And in that respect, crypto is currently behind the curve. There, there aren't any indefinitely sustainable cryptocurrencies presently existing. Um, the, they're all based on cryptographic protocols, um, uh, as a practical matter, single cryptographic protocols. And we know, as a matter of practical reality, that 
all of our cryptographic systems will eventually fall to a combination of technological and mathematical breakthrough. Um, now, having a century isn't that bad, and for a lot of the big ones, that's fairly likely. Um, but still, uh, if you're talking about currencies, numerous stable currencies or quasi-stable government-issued currencies have been around for two to five centuries. Um, and of course, the gold bugs have the point that that gold's an element, and so barring uh, nuclear intervention, it keeps being gold. So there are technological solutions to this. Um, you could have a, a, a cryptocurrency consciously use a multi-algorithm a simultaneous approach, um, but that's more expensive. And right now, people are thinking in terms of generations, uh, or as I say, in some cases, as much as a century rather than true permanence. Um, there's other issues yeah. as well. So, so, so sustainability is one. What, uh, what are the others, the other inputs? Uh, so next after sustainability um, would be uh, management. So this gets to essentially the legitimacy of your political arrangements. Uh, the minimum requirement for legitimate politics is that it's logically sound. Um, that's not even remotely good enough, but um, it's it's a disqualifier. Uh, and checking for the logical soundness of management is usually good enough to rapidly identify Ponzi schemes, um, because the Ponzi schemes never bother with a sensible control mechanism uh, for, their, for, for their currency. Um, and then the third one, which is also extremely rare, uh, is a sort of cultural embedding. Um, and this gets into the value propositions that you were talking about earlier of what intended role does this play in a broader culture and what use is is are the token or tokens intended to be put. Um, and and that's the, that's the fundamental challenge is that you need to walk through each one of these um, technical security, uh, uh, sort of political viability, uh, and then uh, sort of cultural uh, coordination, and uh, something that that actually can hit those markers has a genuine uh, long-term value. Okay, so those are three. Is there anything else in terms of the fundamentals of the token, like uh, transaction volume or um, number of unique investors, or, or something like that? I don't really concentrate on those things that much because the the existing system is so fad driven um the the projects that i've seen that look like they actually have long-term viability and value um are mostly somewhat private uh tokens so for example the u.s government has a token-based system to track the provenance of produce in america um and that seems to be mm -hmm. a fairly viable way to do things. Um, there's a rather bizarre uh, uh, token system uh, operating in the, the, the betting colony off the coast of China. They operate a, a biometric token um, in order to track players and play times so that they can remain in compliance with uh, the government's uh, rules about how much uh, Chinese citizens are allowed to gamble. And, and so that that system works works quite well as a communication protocol. And, and that island's Macau, by the way. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes, I mean, that would seem to me to be a great Petri dish for, for studying a lot of this stuff. Okay, are there any other things that um, you would recommend people use to value these tokens to see if they're long-term investments? I know short-term is totally different science, but uh, for long-term investment. That's that's the the biggie. I find that that list is enough to to throw basically everything out. Um, like I said, there's there's a handful of of private projects, and I'm I'm consulting with people who are trying to build long term projects and and sort of giving them the tools to analyze uh, their political validity and, and sort of cultural connection to to check on. Um, but most of these people in the space are concentrated on either the the fad um, 
which that's like 99%. And then when you get them off, probably a solid 95% of the people you're left with are primarily interested in the cryptographic uh, technology, which is itself pretty fascinating and and, and definitely revolutionary, um, but is also still in, in early phase. Um, and uh, they're they're not focused on on other forms of system ruggedness, if you will. Uh, so the the structures that we know produce more and more rugged systems. I'd like to see a lot more gossip protocols and other more efficient communication protocols uh, be incorporated in in systems going forward. I look at uh, also number of people that are using the platform, like Ethereum. And if they are a platform themselves, uh, how many people are uh, building on top of it? I, I think those are important metrics. It doesn't mean that they're going to sustain itself. I mean, the, the economic model or the tokenomics might be wrong, but those are other indicators that I look at. All right, to wrap things up, uh, Noah, are, are there any tokens out there that, that meet your criteria that are green that you would want to call out? Um, not right now, no. Uh, and yeah, I think not I think you're right. Uh, not really. Uh, both of them are committed to to single hash chains at this point. Um, so for for true long termness, I would agree with you that Ethereum has a lot more uh, sort of useful programmers attached to it, and it may well be that the name of of a long term play would be Ethereum, and that name would have sort of genetic uh, connection, um, just as you know, Ethernet, people in offices will call things Ethernet that aren't Ethernet anymore, but because Ethernet was the dominant technology, it just sort of kept the name. Um, these these technical problems are solvable, and so the things that you're talking about are important both at the technical level, um, because you're going to need those brains to solve those problems, and also important at the cultural level, because those sorts of connections are also important. Um, so Bitcoin t- took the first steps towards solving the technical problems, and Ethereum took the first steps towards solving the cultural problems. Um, the approach both of them took, like I said, is revolutionary, um, but there are numerous and I would say obvious drawbacks with the solutions at hand, and significantly more ruggedness is required, and even uh, significant simplification. Um, so one of the issues right now uh, that particularly keeps these things from becoming broadly useful useful is that the technology is in an early enough state that technical know-how is is critically important and so if you know grandma wants to buy her groceries it's 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 not reasonable for her to also need to be a foremost crypto protocol developer uh, because virtually none of those people exist (laughs) all right well with that noah uh good analogy Let's wrap things up. Where do people get a hold of you if they have any other questions? Uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, I'm at Noah P. Healy at yahoo.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the Noah Healy there. And I have a website, uh, Cordisc, C-O-O-R-D-I-S-C, uh, where you can read about uh, my ideas for how to produce stable and cheap markets for commodities. Excellent. Love to see that. And uh, really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for having me here. Hi, I'm Mark Fidelma with Smart Blocks. I'm giving you my tip of the week. This is the crypto tip of the week. It's called TetraGuard. You can see it right here. This is the world's first decentralized crypto ETF, which has Bitcoin, PaxG, Ethereum, and this fee token called Quadrant. You want to learn more about it? Go to tetraguard.io. This is a big buy for you right now.